and um, with uh, that recording, we'll be able to share it with those delegates and observers who are not able to join us. While we are geospatial experts, we haven't been able to get everybody into one time zone very easily since COVID commenced. So we hope that uh, you'll be able to share this with your colleagues as well. So um, feel free also to add any questions to the chat session and uh, please note your name and organization and country. And we will address those questions during the open discussion and question and answer portion of the side event, which will be the last half an hour. I'm really honored to serve as the moderator for the side event today, and our agenda is to share the newly announced SDG Data Alliance and to mobilize the geospatial community to engage with this effort. I'm very fortunate to be joined today by three esteemed colleagues who have very useful experiences and expertise to share. They're really all doers, if you will, um, and they are working on some really interesting and tangible efforts that I hope will inspire you and mobilize you to work on similar efforts in concert with the SDG Data Alliance in the coming weeks, months, and years. Certainly with the time horizon of the SDGs to 2030, we have the opportunity to really work together for a number of years and to be able to um, really make an impact with geospatial technology. After I set the scene and share some background information on the newly launched SDG Data Alliance, we'll be hearing from Mr. Stephen Keppel, who's the president of the Public Foundation, about the importance, about the importance of, this of this alliance and its, and mission, its mission and how it will be um, powering the possibilities for social impact. And then we'll be hearing from my colleague, Mr. Timothy Fella, who's the team lead for mapping statistics and land administration at ESRI, who will be focusing on the ESRI alignment and support for the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework, or IGIF. We hope that this will be very informative to our geospatial colleagues who are listening in today. And then we are going to be uh, looking at how Ms. Ka Kaimana Bingham, who is the Aloha Plus Dashboard and Partnerships Manager from the Hawaii Local 2030 Hub, has built a subnational SDG data hub for the state of Hawaii, and how they plan to work with island nations in the, um, through the Local 2030 Island Network as an implementing partner of the SDG Data Alliance. And of course, at the end, we'll be open for discussion, questions, and answers, and we look forward to a very exciting uh, conversation with you all. So in summary, just to share a bit about the SDG Data Alliance, it was announced last month at the High Level Partnership, um, High Level Political Forum of the UN um, through an event with the SDG Media Zone. And uh, in summary, it's an open community-driven partnership that is working to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs by building capacity with people, technology, and process. Our work is really grounded in the recognition that reducing inequalities of all kinds um, is fundamental to achieving all the SDGs. And of course, reducing inequalities specifically is SDG 10. Um, this will help us create a just, healthy, and prosperous world where no one is left behind and everyone can thrive. And of course, we see the quote here by Michelle Bachelet, who's the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And she notes, there really must be progress on SDG 10 for all the S other SDGs to succeed. We need to reduce those inequalities so all the other efforts can actually be sustainable. So this is a listing of the founding partners of the SDG Data Alliance. Um, they are the United Nations, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Public Foundation, and ESRI. And we are joined today but also by the Hawaii Local 2030 Hub and Local 2030 Island Network as an example of an implementing partner. Our vision really is to enable governments, NGOs, and partners of all kinds from the national to the local level to provide and foster open data in effective systems and frameworks for monitoring progress on the SDGs using leading geospatial technology. We invited many of you here to participate in the side event as you may be listed as one of the prospective countries that we're interested in working with in, in the initial phases. And so I'm pleased um, to note that the Alliance is key, keen to work with about 17 member states on implementation uh, to further the earlier work on establishing SDG data hubs that we have done with other nations, such as Ireland, UAE, Mexico, and more. Uh, please note that the list here is of about 20 prospective countries um, for this next phase of implementations, but of course we welcome other opportunities to work with other member states as well. 
In terms of the outcomes, uh, we hope that with each member state, we'll be able to support the following. Uh, technology capacity building and, and system evaluation, a technology and training um, opportunities that will take advantage of the SDG Data Alliance partners' expertise and resources, uh, using core technology deployment and, or making core technology deployment possible and creating an open interoperable and standards-based services-oriented platform that will utilize relevant, accessible, sustainable development data. And uh, lastly, continuous knowledge and communication um, activities that are going to be um, uh, organized by the STG Data Alliance until 2030 and beyond. Okay, so now um, that you have that basic foundation about the Alliance, I wish to invite uh, Stephen from Public Foundation to please commence our series of presentations. And Stephen, I invite you to share your screen. Thank you, Carmel. Um, just give me a second here. Great to, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and great to be on with everyone. Let me share my presentation here. Yeah, I, oh, yeah you see it. So I do have it available if you, you need it at any point. Let me just see if I can get to, um, here we go. All good, Carmel, can you see the slide? Yes, it looks good. Perfect. Um, so yeah, my name is Stephen Keppel. I'm the president of Public Foundation. Um, we're a very proud partner of the SDG Data Alliance. And I thought I would um, take you through a little bit today about, uh, initially just about who we are, what what um, what public is, um, but, but really um, more about the Data Alliance, how it came together, um, the importance of partnerships and collaboration, um, and also an example of some of the work that we're doing uh, right now. But first, I want to, you know, introduce a little bit of Public Foundation. A, a few of you may be aware, but um, for those that aren't, um, Public Foundation was established uh, about 10 years ago with a mission to engage global change makers and mobilize action around the world. Um, we have a, a series of partnerships um, in the US uh, and, and in a number of countries around the world and a number of strategic partnerships with the United Nations, different agencies and actors within the UN system. Um, and we are a passionate and key partner in the promotion of the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. How do we do this? How do we accomplish our mission? We think a lot about um, how do we leverage our expertise and our partners' expertise in media, data, and technology? And how do we create projects and programs that create positive social impact and social change around the world? Again, with the primary objective of achieving the 2030 Global Agenda and the SDGs. Partnerships are key to everything that we do, uh, and, and Public Foundation specializes in a lot of public-private partnerships. Um, we started off in the last decade with a number of uh, media partnerships with the Obama White House and then uh, with a number of UN agencies and, and also in the private sector. So the Data Alliance, um, as Carmel mentioned, she described kind of the, some of the key points about it and the objectives. Um, it, was, it was officially announced in July um, during the high level political forum at the UN um, and, and the ESRI uh, user conference. Um, but it's actually been in the works for a number of years. Uh, Public, along with ESRI and United Nations partners, created and developed SDG.org, um, really as an initial really? effort to provide some transparency around the data used for global reporting. Um, and then more recently, um, have been collaborating with the Kellogg Foundation um, and together kind of created this SDG Data Alliance. And again, the goal is how do we bring these different actors together, um, engage with the, the GGIM community, of course, and um, and think about how do we use this GIS technology and, and other data technologies to ad advance and accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. We're doing this by creating a number of data hubs across developing nations in Latin America, developing nations in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. 
how do we do this? Um, I mentioned partnerships already in um, what public uh, does, and it's a big part of who we are. Um, so with this project, we've taken a multi partnership approach throughout. Um, and there's a few key partners here. We have philanthropy partners that are providing funding and program management. Um, you know, this is the, this is the Kellogg Foundation, the Foundation, uh, obviously. Our role in this really is to kind of serve as the kind of key linkage point between the different partners and help manage the program and funds um, and uh, help oversee the execution of the creation of these data hubs. Um, there's the private sector, uh, which helps provide in-kind services, expertise, strategy, innovation. Um, Esri here is the primary private sector partner um, that has uh, has been key and instrumental to the data alliance and, and, and bringing it alive and, and creating these hubs around the world. Multilateral partners are also key. Um, we, have a, we have a global reach with the data alliance, and so they help bring that influence and expertise. Again, whether it's uh, the UN, we're working closely with the UN Statistical Division, um, other different aspects of the UN um, resident coordinators offices, but also multilateral institutions, regional development banks, um, and, and other partners uh, on the ground in the countries where we're, we're implementing the hubs. Uh, next, we have local governments, um, which are key. Uh, local governments are really key to this process. Um, you know, they provide national leadership, staff, access to data, and most importantly, you know, help to clarify what their objectives are. Um, in, in how we can work together to support their needs. And then finally, local organizations. Um, these could be NGOs or other civic groups um, that may be in the country and have access to data um, uh, and are seeing different things on the ground. Um, because the, again, this cannot just be a top-down approach. It really has to come full circle um, and involve key actors in the countries where we're working. Next, I'll give an example <clears throat> of uh, a data hub that we've been working on uh, together since January. Um, as Carmel mentioned, other data hubs have been established in places like Ireland and Mexico and in, in the UAE. Um, we began working together, um, well, initially started working together on developing a data hub in Haiti during COVID and obviously had to pause a bit because of uh, um, the challenges that that the shut the global shutdown um, caused, um, but since January have been very active um, there, and and um, you know I guess I'll start with the objective really, which is is to, and th again this is an example of what it looks like on the ground and what we're trying to replicate in different countries around the world. But the goal is to use nationally integrated geospatial frameworks and support Haitian institutions to better coordinate and realize their data needs for achieving the SDGs. A country like Haiti, which has gone through many challenges um, throughout its history, but also in its recent history, um, doesn't have a great source of, of data, doesn't have an ability to view the data that even exists in a way that can be effective. So often the government and other actors, whether they're aid organizations or multilateral partners, are operating blind you know, when they're making decisions about whether to invest in education or sustainable projects or health, um, there's not the information that they can access and see to make those proper decisions and help Haiti achieve the SDGs. So that's one of the, the key things that we're working on. Um, prior to the the recent challenges that haiti's had and the the assassination of the president and the change of government and then even more recently the earthquake um we had seen some real progress um there are actors in the government on the ground that are passionate about um geospatial data and the importance of it and the need of bringing it together in one space we've conducted a number, a number of meetings and some basic trainings with with um with local leaders, the Haitian government, uh, regional stakeholders like the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and have put together a main uh, stakeholder group. Um, and we had received government buy-in um, before uh, some of the recent changes. Um, but I, you know, I, I will say, despite all of the challenges, 
our partners in Haiti, inclu including um, some of our the local consultants that we're working with, are quite resilient, um, and we have reestablished um, connections and relationships with the new local government, and um, continue to work forward, move forward, and 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 look ahead toward um, establishing. Uh, the framework and eventually uh, an SDG data hub in Haiti that will provide open data. Um, there are challenges to working in a place like Haiti and other countries, developing countries around the world that, that are unstable, again, whether it's because of political issues or environmental issues. Um, but we think it's key really to, to, to keep momentum moving forward. Um, and I think we have to learn to adapt and um, work with government and governments and local actors even when there are crises because uh, really time is running out to achieve the uh, 2030 agenda. So what's next? Um, I think one of the things we're interested in, in, in excited about doing is further engaging with the GGIM community and so I'm very thankful to be able to present to you today. Um, we are working hard on establishing new hubs in these, you know, 17 plus uh, initial countries that have um, that have been outlined, and then we really want to expand to new countries as well. Um, we think this framework um, and the data alliance um, expanding to new countries will be key for the world to complete uh, the sustainable de development goals in time for 2030. So, I will. Uh, stop there and I know we'll um, have questions later but um let me stop sharing and pass it back great thank you thanks so much uh Stephen so we appreciate the partnership we appreciate the uh, commitment and so forth that the public foundation has brought to the alliance and we're really excited to uh, you know continue to work on these efforts in Haiti and beyond um, so now I will ask Tim to please uh, join us and share his screen. And of course, there'll be opportunities to ask Stephen and all of us questions at the end as well. And uh, see your screen. Looks good. Thank you, Tim. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Tim Fellow. I'm the team lead for mapping statistics and land administration business here at ISRI. So I would like to use the, the limited time I have uh, today to briefly talk about the integrated geospatial information framework and how ESRI aligns with and can support organizations and our users with applying this authoritative framework within their own national context. For most people, ESRI is a, a GIS company. However, over the past 50 years, ESRI has been around. We've learned that it takes much more than technology to develop and sustain a modern spatial data infrastructure. It also requires investments in people, processes, partnerships, and much more. And for this reason, ESRI has evolved over the years to also provide different consulting services, training resources, special programs, products, and partnerships that can support our users with developing their geospatial infrastructure. So my presentation today will address these within the context of the, the IGIF. So we wouldn't all be here today if we didn't recognize the, the importance of geospatial data and the role it plays within a nation's information infrastructure. Many of the chief public works projects of the past century, whether it's road systems to bring products to markets or pipelines to deliver oil to refineries and grid systems to bring electricity to homes, were government initiated projects that efficiently linked market supply with consumer demand. These infrastructure fueled economic growth and today, governments must invest in and sustain similar infrastructure for data to stay competitive into the 21st century. Geospatial is a key part of a nation's information infrastructure because it provides that integrative platform for all digital data that has a location dimension to it. Not all geospatial data sets need to be part of that national information infrastructure. UNGGIM defines a relatively small number of fundamental geospatial data themes selected as most, often underpinning a wide range of applications across many industries. They include things such as parcel data, population data, land cover data, but may include other data sets deemed essential for national development priorities. 
So the custodians for these fundamental data sets are part of a broader national geospatial community of interest. Based on decades of experience, Esri's found this geospatial community of interest is one of providers and consumers. The providers are the custodians of the systems of record for those fundamental data sets previously mentioned and appear on the bottom of the screen here. These data sets are fundamental in supporting national economic, social, and environmental objectives, but also underpin geospatial applications downstream, such as in planning, emergency response, property taxation, national security, which is what you see at the top. The consumers of these fundamental data sets often integrate their own data and seek to derive insights and inform policy decisions from this information. The addition of data hubs, geoportals, SEI illustrate what we are seeing as a common pattern of exchange between government producers and consumers of geospatial data, and we call this the system of engagement. The geospatial maturity of an organization reflects movement from simple data access through catalogs to data-driven insights and solutions to answer specific questions and provide knowledge on demand. Esri has been working with geospatial authorities for many years. And through these long-standing relationships, we see that geospatial authorities face an array of challenges when it comes to producing timely, accurate, and trusted geospatial information, let alone pursuing digital transformation. This includes complying with domestic legislation and policy, doing more with less money, hiring and retaining high-quality talent, and doing all this while contributing to economic growth and competitiveness. Recognizing that nations often struggle when developing and strengthening their geospatial information management and related infrastructure, the UN and the World Bank developed the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. It aims to provide a basis and guide for lower to middle income countries to reference when modernizing their approach to geospatial information management. It does this through nine strategic pathways, which are depicted in the diagram here. And these nine strategic pathways can be conceptualized into three overarching themes related to data governance, technology, and very importantly, people. The ESRI ecosystem, as we like to refer to it, provides a multiplicity of resources to help countries align with and implement the integrated geospatial information framework. So this ESRI ecosystem that I refer to provides an interconnected web of resources to enable the people, processes, data, and technology required to sustain an integrated geospatial information infrastructure. ESRI aligns with and supports countries with their IGIF implementation through a combination of ways. First and foremost, ESRI provides its users with the world's most powerful mapping and spatial analytics software. But beyond technology, ESRI offers its users a robust selection of education and training resources, special programs and partnerships, and professional consulting group that can help support stakeholders at different points along their geospatial journey. So I'd like to take a few minutes to dis discuss these areas of alignment in more depth. So if we look at IGF strategic pathways one, two, three, uh, they address representative governance, leadership and vision, policy and legislation, as well as the business model for sustaining geospatial infrastructure. Beyond technology, ESRI has a history of supporting foundation data agencies in many of the topics relevant to the IGIF's strategic pathways. As it relates to pathways one through three, ESRI's professional services group has helped organizations develop geospatial strategies and roadmaps, adapt to change through change management consulting, embrace new technology, define data sharing agreements, and stay abreast of good practices that can be applied in an organization. Where there may be gaps in the services ESRI can provide, we rely on a rich ecosystem of partners in our global distributor network. These partners provide services in complementary areas such as financial modeling and cost recovery to legal and policy reforms. Strategic Pathway 4 touches upon ESRI's core area of business, which is helping organizations develop and deploy their geospatial infrastructure. We do this through ArcGIS, as well as ESRI Professional Consulting in our global distributor network. ArcGIS helps our users organize and manage all aspects of geospatial infrastructure. It manages and organizes apps, models, and notebooks. It manages and provides access to data and services through a catalog of a portal. 
It organizes information products that create that people create. It also organizes people, so individuals have secure identities and groups within organizations. ArcGIS also integrates all types of spatially referenced data, whether it's tabular data, unstructured data, 3D, and BIM, making it easier for users to leverage one platform for multiple data types. We also provide users many industry-specific templates, data models, and workflows that can allow users to get up and running quickly. The Living Atlas can also help those users who may have limited data to start with. So using the same products and tools that our users apply, Esri maintains the Living Atlas of the world. The ArcGIS Living Atlas of the world is the foremost collection of geographic information from around the globe and includes base maps and imagery, open street map vector layers, apps, and thousands and thousands of data layers that one can use and integrate into their own work. In the Living Atlas, the data is free for all the users, whereas the marketplace can be leveraged to per, uh, purchase premium data sets, which are curated and delivered by Esri's partners around the globe. So ArcGIS delivers the essential infrastructure for national geospatial authorities. This includes applications and workflows that can be used to collect and integrate data from a wide variety of sources. This data can then be cleaned, structured, and managed using industry-specific tools and data models. Recently, we have also introduced new industry-specific geodatabases, like the Utility Network for Utilities, and Telecoms, or the Parcel Fabric for Cadaster. Spatial analytics and data science are at the center of GIS. This is all about solving problems and advancing science. ESRI has over 2,000 tools that support data engineering, visualization exploration, and new and enhanced tools that support predictive modeling capability that was used extensively in the COVID response. We also provide users with the tools for producing charts, maps, dashboards, and other information products and services. This includes automated map and chart production, as well as map generalization, which have been proven to deliver time and cost savings to many national mapping organizations around the globe. And finally, an important part of ArcGIS is the system of engagement. Esri provides easy data sharing and collaboration capabilities, which I will discuss in more detail later in the presentation. So what a lot of people don't realize is that Esri invests more than 30% of our annual turnover back into research and development each year. This allows us to advance the science of GIS while also continuing to work with our users to build tools to help them do their job better. This investment ensures our users are able to stay abreast of new technological developments and deliver new and innovative products and services to their users. Our in-house consulting experts have also assisted governments with embracing innovation, adopting new technologies, and establishing geospatial centers of excellence. By investing more than 30% of our annual revenue back into research and development, we are enabling our users to take advantage of innovations in technology. We all know GIS is changing rapidly. It's advancing based on new forms of data, new kinds of computing, new kinds of measurement, and new kinds of innovation. And it's not just one tool that transforms everything, but really it's the union of many things coming together that is enabling this infrastructure to advance. And these advancements are enabling authoritative data providers to leapfrog and achieve efficiencies, deliver new capabilities, and take advantage of new collaboration models. As it relates to pathway number six, Esri has a decades-long commitment to open standards and interoperability. Esri actively contributes to international standards development processes such as OGC, GEO, ISO, and has a history of open sourcing its fat format specifications, such as the shapefile and index 3D scene layers. We also align with many industry specific frameworks, such as the land administration domain model, which facilitates interoperability on many levels. Our commitment to standards helps organizations and our users meet their standards compliance obligations while also facilitating interoperability with other systems and softwares. There are an abundance of ways in which the user community can engage with and partner with Esri. We have user communities who are, we regularly engage with and exchange information on business requirements and roadmaps. Uh, for example, there's the user community for geospatial authorities, which is a collaborative forum through which key national geospatial authorities communicate their technology needs to Esri so we can build them. 
electricity programs that enable governments, educational institutions, and nonprofits to benefit from access to free or highly discounted geospatial technology. These programs offer a means for emerging economies to gain access to the geospatial infrastructure needed to build their data supply chains. Lastly, we also provide the tools and applications for our users to engage with and get community participation from their stakeholders and to build their own trusted partnerships and strategic alliances. This includes regional ge geo portals, such as those developed for Africa and the Caribbean in recent years, which provide an open mapping community where data and insights from across the region can be brought together. It also includes the SDG Data Alliance, where technology and training will be provided to enable the development of 17 national SDG data hubs, which will enable from a local to a global level. Moving on to pathway eight, people are really central to the sustainability of any geospatial information infrastructure. It's for this reason, Esri is committed to supporting GIS users of all ages and stages of the professional development and education. This is important because long-term capacity building programs and education systems are needed to sustain geospatial information management. For primary and secondary schools, ESRI offers the ArcGIS for Schools bundle, which provides schools with web and mobile applications, desktop licenses, and extensions free of charge for instructional use. For higher education, ESRI offers highly discounted software fa for faculty, staff, and students for learning, research, and administration. And for professionals, ESRI has a vast offering of hands-on, self-paced ArcGIS lessons and related resources, including MOOCs, webinars, and self-help guides, many of which are free for our users and the public. ESRI is also committed to growing the geospatial community and helping young professionals identify opportunities in the GIS sector. We do this through a combination of meetups, GeoNet, and the Young Professionals Network. And altogether, these educational programs help raise the awareness and develop the skills and resources needed to utilize geospatial information for decision making. Finally, the real value in technology comes in empowering everyone in the organization to have access to the best information applications to do their job. Modern organizations understand that they can meet their business goals by leveraging location intelligence and implementing a system of engagement. Our tools are designed to enable everyone within an organization to access the information they need to more effectively carry out their daily tasks. This systematic approach complements an organization's investment in its larger business systems by providing convenient access to relevant spatial data, as well as easy to use applications that can enable collaboration across the organization. These apps can help organizations share or explain their data, solicit input from the public through surveys and report progress against key performance indicators. One of the customer solutions is uh, that's designed to facilitate communication and engagement is ArcGIS Hub. It helps users organize communities in response to initiatives through open data, community engagement tools like story maps, performance dashboards, online content, events and discussions, and community feedback mechanisms such as surveys. And it's this solution and set of capabilities that is a core component of the SDG Data Alliance and SDG Data Hubs that will be created across more than 17 countries in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In conclusion, Esri's mission is to build the world's leadest, leading GIS technology and support our users through the implementation of successful systems. We do this through professional consulting, but also providing training and edu educational resources to advance spatial literacy at all levels. We also seek to cultivate a healthy and diverse user community. And lastly, but most importantly, we seek to contribute to society through critical partnerships like the SDG Data Alliance that can lead to a more sustainable world. So I wanna thank you for your, your time today and look forward to the, the Q&A session following the, the next presentation. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, our third presentation, um, it's first of all great to think of all of our resources that is really in, in light of the IGIF pathways. It's, it's really uh, interesting to see that 
uh, and, and uh, be able to share. Um, I wanted to now uh, invite Kaimana Bingham to give her presentation. Uh, let me get it shared up on the screen. Um, let's see. Hopefully you're now going to be able to see the screen. Do you see it? Yes, thank you, Carmel. Wonderful, um, Kaimana. Yep. Aloha and good morning. Um, my name is Kaimana Bingham and I am the Aloha Plus uh, Dashboard and Partnership Manager at Hawaii Green Growth. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today um, and following those two wonderful previous uh, presentations um, before mine. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for the invitation to share with you all on behalf of the Hawaii Green Growth Local 2030 Hub on the Aloha Plus Challenge and the Local 2030 Islands Network. Um, on the next slide, I want to talk about our partnership, which was touched on a little bit um, at the local level in Stephen's presentation. But um, by way of background, Hawaii Green Growth is a network based organization up of 50 individuals and institutions. So, this on the screen you see is a snapshot of um, some of our partners. Our uh, genealogy is rooted in the 2011 APEC Leaders Summit with its recognition for the need for a green growth economic recovery emerging from the 2008 financial crisis. This I find is an important point um, as we find ourselves in the middle of another social and economic crisis. COVID is inherently about disruption. Um, it's a postcard from the future of a climate disrupted world if we don't achieve the sustainable development goals. A green growth recovery is needed more than ever to build back a more sustainable, equitable, and resilient community. And as a network, we are committed to advancing economic, social, and environmental goals and accelerating and scaling local solutions. On the next slide, um, the Aloha Plus Challenge and the UN SDG wheel that you see here is um, a a relationship that we see. Um, and just to give you guys uh, a little background, the Aloha Plus Challenge is a joint political leadership. So state, counties, legislature with networks of business, civil society, and community partners. It focuses on the triple bottom line, which is social, economic, and environmental challenges. And it tracks progress on our local goals to deliver against the sustainable development goals. On our next um, slide, the Aloha Plus dashboard um, is really our tooling mechanism. And it was developed using, um, originally it was uh, on Socrata and using the Esri software. We migrated our dashboard, which is developed using locally and culturally appropriate metrics and indicators to measure progress, to provide transparency and accountability. It was um, the metrics were co-developed over four years, now six years of data with the support from state and counties, um, groups such as Hawaii Environmental Funders Group, Hawaii Data Collaborative, um, Hawaii Geographic Information Coordination Council, and other like sponsors and network partners. On the screen here, you'll see our priority areas um, that include clean energy transformation, local food production, solid waste reduction, natural resource management, smart sustainable communities, and um, green workforce and education. And along each of these goals, we have um, target areas that help us achieve those goals structured uh, similarly to the SDG framework. Um, and I just wanna note that actually the Aloha Plus Challenge was uh, developed prior to the SDGs. For the next slide, the Aloha Plus goals and the UN SDGs crosswalk. So this is an exercise that we did um, in 2014. And when we realized that the SDGs needed to be delivered at the local level by member nations, regions, communities, and individuals. So this is our approach to our local framework for the UN SDGs. Each of the six local goals that you see on the screen here, um, again, clean energy, local food, natural resource management, waste reduction, smart sustainable communities, and green workforce and education, um, track against the 17 UN SDGs. Specifically, we have um, we currently have three goals uh, 
clean energy, smart sustainable communities, and green workforce and education that track progress against um, SDG 10, which is what our focus is here today, to reduce inequalities within and among countries. So to drill into that on the next slide a little bit, um, one of the examples of how we are addressing the SDG 10 target for 2030 is tracking um, Hawaii representatives and state senators as well as voter participation. And I want to highlight that we um, we also have areas in energy, equity, um, housing, green jobs, and education. But I think really adding the geospatial information capabilities to this existing data and dashboard would help drive decision making and policy in the communities who need it most. Um, so really excited for that intersection. Um, to go on to the next slide, on all of the different data sources um, that we have in our data hub. Um, our open data Aloha Plus model is scalable and tracks our local contribution to all 17 SDGs, as I mentioned um, previously. And our data sources include makes up of our sustainable business forum, so that's the private sector in our network, um, and community data, community um, residential data, household data. Um, this data helps inform decision making as part of our ongoing stakeholder process of which we convene 50 meetings per year um, at minimum and then one large annual event with our network partners and we have been able to partner with other islands and share our development process which i will touch on in the next slide So a little background on island supporting islands um, and being from Hawaii, uh, two years ago as part of the Local 2030 initiative launched by the Deputy Secretary of General of the United Nations, Hawaii was recognized as a Local 2030 hub tasked with scaling Hawaii's sustainability model in a locally and culturally appropriate way to other island economies. The power of local hubs resides in the space where communities, together with the UN system and external partners, identify their priorities with respect to the SDGs and implement innovative solutions that address local needs. As the United Nations Local 2030 Hub, Hawaii is uniquely positioned to advance strategic engagement in the region by strengthening partnerships in the Pacific region and facilitating climate adaptation and resilience in Pacific Island nations. Hawaii Green Growth has developed a transferable and stakeholder based framework focused on measuring progress through our ESRI platform, highlighting our dashboard that informs that those decision making processes for local jurisdictions to achieve sustainable development and resilient objectives. On the next slide, um, and as part of our commitment as a local 2030 hub, we formed the local 2030 island network. We launched the local 2030 island network with key partners, including RMI, FSM, Guam, Ireland, and others. Hawaii Green Growth is co-secretariat alongside Global Island Partnership, which is GLISPA. And we believe that this is a collective challenge that needs collective action. So we are committed to working with our neighbors, local, regional, and international. On the next slide, um, just to give a little bit more context on islands inspiring islands as we are at the forefront of climate change. Um, in 2014, the Hawaii Green Growth Network launched the Aloha Plus Challenge which was inspired by the Micronesia Challenge and Caribbean Challenge, as Hawaii's culturally rooted, locally driven framework with strong political leadership uh, to implement it, the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, again, the network convenes over 50 meetings a year to steward and accelerate the achievement of the six Aloha Plus Challenge Goals. The local 2030 islands network also serves as a central resource for island led solutions and links islands in new ways to address sustainability, climate change and other environmental issues. In the next slide, I will demonstrate how the local 2030 island network scaled the framework with one of our partners. 
Uh, so Guam Green Growth launched in April of this year. Um, we had been working with them since January, and you can see their um, action framework in um, methodology is modeled very similarly similarly to um, Hawaii Green Growth. Uh, again, so in April, Guam developed in collaboration with Hawaii Green Growth and Esri Partners the G3 dashboard to provide public access to data on all of their locally relevant goals and projects that are aligned with the uh, SDGs. And what we've been finding with our local island 2030 partners, um, there's around five to six categories of actions or goals. Um, so Aloha Plus Challenge has identified six, or as Guam has um, identified five. Uh, other regions have similarly five to six pillars or goals or priority areas um, that all track against the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and in this framework, uh, similar to the Hawaii Green Growth. They have a working group. Um, they have a cross-sectoral organizations represented in their private-public partnership. And then they have um, 800 subsets of goals, objectives, and actions. Um, and scaling the dashboard helps show that islands are leaders in sustainability and that locally driven metrics are what will deliver progress against the SDGs. And then in my next slide. Um, so this is my uh, final and conclusion uh, to this uh, presentation. And I just wanted to say that Hawaii Green Growth and the local 2030 Island Network are currently in the process of working together to develop um, the Aloha Plus template framework to create dashboards similar to Guam and FSM and RMI. And we are very pleased to be partnering with ESRI as we are joining the SDG Alliance as implementation partners for member states to showcase the impact and the process and framework of a local to global model. The commitment to changing behavior through our community first is how we envision paving the way for other islands and communities to be empowered through local partnerships that can scale um, our global efforts. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm very excited to see how the other 17 member prospect nations deliver progress on the SDGs using this technology and a locally driven process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaimana. Um, she is indeed joining us at 3.30 in the morning <laughs> for this presentation. So I greatly appreciate it. What a wonderful presentation for sharing your expertise in these areas. Um, it was, uh, I wasn't sure if I'd be seeing you at 3.30 <laughs> if, uh, you know, when we invited you originally. So I greatly appreciate your commitment to this effort and the partnership and uh, sharing all of these great resources and methods and so forth as you have across the island nations and as uh, I believe there's about 53 island nations in the UN member states and so it's a large number of um, uh, countries and nations that are going to be facing some of certainly some significant um, challenges in the future um, with uh, resilience and climate resilience and so forth so uh, there's certainly spatial challenges and of course we are all about reducing inequalities spatial and otherwise so uh, great thanks so much for your presentation if I could ask um, the other presenters to come back uh, on video uh, if Tim and Stephen could do that and uh, Mohammed Shariful um, your video is currently sharing if it would be possible for you to turn it off That'd be great so that we can um, do a Q&A with those that are presenting, um, that presented, as well as um, those that are, would like to ask questions. Um, so I'd like to just ask if you have any um, questions, feel free to put those into the comments with your name and organization noted, as well as anybody who'd like to raise their hand or share any thoughts that they have um, about the uh, presentations we've just seen or about the Alliance. So the floor is open. We have about 40 folks on, on online right now with us. So hopefully some of you have some questions. We invited many of the per, um, prospective countries to join us. So we hope you'll have some questions for us as well. Any questions? Um, Carmel, I don't have a question. Could I have some um, resources in, in the chat for folks? Yes, of course. Yep, absolutely. 
um, feel free to put, put links and resources and any of the countries who have developed SDG data hubs, we welcome your links there. And um, I see uh, Maria has a question. Uh, could Esri give us a particular example of technology shared for GIS? So some of the maybe tools and technologies that are needed for, uh, could you clarify maybe Maria, like if we're implementing the um, hubs or what are your thoughts there? Yes, different tools. Okay. Tim, do you want to take that question? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if this question is particularly in the context of the SDG Data Alliance. If so, one of the, I think, the key products or solutions that is included with that is the ArcGIS Hub, which is really focused on that system of engagement and uh, supporting organizations with the, the collaboration with their different stakeholders, the sharing of data, um, and you essentially um, push information out there to, to support decision making. Uh, beyond the SDG Data Alliance, I had mentioned there's a number of different ways that uh, organizations can, can partner with ESRI, um, in particular to gain access to free or discounted GIS technology. And two programs I'd like to specifically call out are the uh, Official Statistics Modernization Program, as well as the Land Administration Modernization Program, which are Two, uh, two programs that we launched about three years ago, I think it was back in 2018, which is focused on uh, small island developing states and some of the least developed countries as defined by the, the UN and World Bank. And essentially what we've done as ESRI is packaged together a, um, a set of technology, including our desktop technology and enterprise and a, a multiplicity of other tools and products that can enable uh, a national statistical organization or a national cadastral organization to stand up a, essentially an enterprise environment for the, the collection, management, and dissemination of data. So these are just a, a few of the, the programs and I guess tools that are uh, made available, but happy to connect offline to, to share more details as desired. Okay, thank you, Tim. Fantastic. I see uh, Mr. Rios has his hand raised. We welcome your comments. Hi, uh, Eduardo. Hi. I'm uh, Eduardo Rios Neto. I'm president of IBGE Brazil, the National Institute of Geography and Statistics. We already participate. Uh, we have a regional hub uh, that is just starting uh, with big data. AI and machine learning uh, along uh, with UNSD. Uh, so that's already uh, kind of an investment, but uh, one possibility. Uh, I learned about the meeting just today, so I can, uh, like, in the last minute, uh, so I didn't have chance to discuss uh, with the staff there at IBG, but we do cooperate also with ESRI. Hi, Linda, uh, and uh, we have a great pop, which is like uh, a world pop uh, experiment. We are progressing on that, and we intend to interact uh, regionally. So maybe one possibility, but I mean, it's too early, but IBGE is one of the few national statistics offices that integrate geography and statistics. So we are pretty much into a IGIF frame, framework. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could bundle the two hubs, like had some scale. I know that Stefan is there. Hi, Stefan, too. So I'm open uh, to conversations. Uh, we are, uh, I'm designing in the midst of the challenge of uh, for the census next year, uh, what I call, I wrote that myself with no staff involved because I want them to folk 
focus on their challenge, but I'm designing a long-term strategic plan for the institute that I called IBGE 4.0 and uh, integrating uh, geography with the statistics and doing data science as the other had mm -hmm. are key to that. So just to say that we are here to cooperate in whatever is possible. Yeah. Well, as one of the prospective countries, as you engage with the UN um, GGIM Secretariat and the Alliance and so forth, we're very pleased to know that you're already working on some of these endeavors and to work with the national and then ultimately the regional level would be fantastic to have these type of SDG data hubs available. So um, we look forward to the cooperation and the opportunity to participate. Um, I've noted a few other questions in the um, uh, in the chat that, that relate to some of your comments, Mr. Rios. Um, so uh, just rolling back up, um, Lita, I will get to your question for Hawaii Green Growth in a moment, but I just wanted to note that there seem to be some questions around, you know, what kind of licenses and um, how to um, help acquire the technologies um, that are the foundation for the, the, the hubs. Um, so uh, Tim has shared um, the... Um, land administration modernization um, uh, offering, as well as the official statistics modernization program. Uh, the links are there. If you are one of the eligible countries, please submit the um, uh, interest into the website for each of those. And we will certainly be getting back to you to support your um, specific countries with the technology that is available through those grant programs and modernization programs. Um, Greg, you asked specifically, is there a consideration for a geospatial information modernization program? Uh, it's more fundamental and urgently needed for many mapping agencies around the world. Uh, Tim, is that something you want to address or um, sort of discuss how each of the other two programs may support that? Yeah, I'll give a shot at that. I, I'll admit, I don't think we've had discussions yet about a specific program focused specifically on geospatial information modernization. What we've tended to target are some of the, the key what we call uh, geospatial authorities that are typically responsible for leading the, the development, putting in place of uh, spatial data infrastructure for nations. So that's why you see, for instance, these two programs focus on uh, national cadastral and uh, official statistics organizations that are oftentimes some of the lead actors as it relates to uh, putting in place SDI or contributing to SDI at a national level. But definitely um, open to discussing with Greg um, other types of needs that may be out there. So maybe that's an opportunity that we could follow up on after the, the session today. Fantastic. And uh, uh, Andrew, uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, you asked Tim also, is the scheme for to support statistics and national mapping agencies open to all developing countries? Um, and that he's working specifically with Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. I know we have a representative from Moldova here today and perhaps some of the other countries as well. Um, and once again, on those web links that Tim shared, there's um, eligibility for each region. It, it breaks down which countries are eligible. So um, there is that opportunity there. Um, yep. Anything further, Tim, that you want to add? Or maybe Linda wants to join in any comments? Yeah, I'll just add a quick comment, Carmel, because we are adding some additional countries to the statistics modernization program. I'm updating the web pages now. So um, Andy, a couple of the countries you've asked about, I believe, are being added. We can sync offline, but uh, check back in about a week and we'll have the page updated. Mm -hmm. Great. And just to confirm for ODAT from Mozambique, yes, indeed, you are eligible to receive technology under the Data Alliance. So we look forward to not only supporting you with all of the outcomes and deliverables that I discussed at the beginning of the uh, session today, but also to uh, provide that underlying for, you know, technology as well. Um, I wanted to go back up. Linda, you had a question for Hawaii Green Growth. Um, and the question was, uh, you really liked how they organized their goals. Obviously, they're based on kind of cultural and local needs and, and are very um, specific to their uh, geography. Um, and she asked if you could expand, Kamana, on how you uh, determined what your six focal areas would be. Yeah, that's a great question. And I just want to note that it took um, about four years of convening cross-sectoral um, stakeholders because 
as an island, um, we have limited space. So, you know, trying to identify the needs around um, clean energy, solar, uh, wind and agriculture and housing. Um, it took a lot of time to engage in short term consensus building around longer term goals um, and identifying those shared priorities. And we uh, sequenced uh, these stakeholder engagements um, cross sectoral to um, and use this approach to provide the opportunity to focus on each tar target while maintaining progress. On sorry, I a, you cut out on the last three words or so of that sentence. Oh, sorry. Um, so we, uh, de for developing the indicators and the dashboard content for the six targets on the Aloha Push Challenge, um, there it's kind of a sing song around um, and we timed and sequenced the approach of our stakeholder engagement meetings cross sectoral to um, provide the opportunity to focus on each goal while maintaining progress on the others to actually complete the dashboard. But it did take um, multi stakeholder convening um, to identify those six priority, six priority areas and then the um, target areas that helped um, that are helping us achieve those goals. Yeah, I also should note, um, thank you so much for that. So um, that I think it's really an important process to go through that effort where you really think about what, how the SDGs are really important to your particular region and have those convenings and bring all, in all the stakeholders and all. And as you said, it took, I think four years, you said. So, you know, it takes a long while to get that sort of buy-in, but I think you have a great outcome at the end because of the process that you went through. So it's fantastic. And now you can share that methodology with others. Um, so um, I did also just want to add, in addition to the two modernization programs that Tim um, um, shared, any of the IDA countries that are interested in developing SDG data hubs, um, Israel will also be providing the technology for a few years for that, as well as 85% um, discount on the maintenance for the software all the way till 2030. And so that, that commitment to support all the IDA countries, um, that which are the um, lowest income countries, um, is there also from ESRI in addition to the modernization grant programs. And so all of the tools that would be needed to develop hubs similar to the ones you've seen shared here or are shared on sdg.org, um, all of that technology would be provided for the coming couple of years. So um, as part of this process, we also just wanted to announce that and make sure you knew about that. Um, and Linda, I see you, you noted Mar uh, Marlene's question I was just about to address. Um, so Marlene had asked, um, uh, it, does Esri ever think about developing a solution for SDGs, uh, combining licensed enterprise and open source solutions to reduce the costs of the, for those who want to adhere to but have limited resources? So we do have a commitment through 2030 for those with the most limited resources, that program that I just mentioned. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, perhaps people can share our you know, Tim, Linda, myself, we can also share our, our emails in the chat here if you're interested in continuing the conversation for your specific um, nation. We'd be very happy to talk with you all. Um, so that is uh, another thing I just wanted to mention. Um, the um, commitment and so forth is lasting. It's not just for a year or something like that. It's really to support or, um, countries to achieve the goals all the way through 2030. Um, and we do, we are in the process of developing some SDG um, uh, templates. One of my colleagues that was on the call, I don't know if she is still, um, uh, Deepthi Kutcher is here. Um, let's see if she's still on. Yes, she is. Um, she's from our professional services team and her and her colleagues have been working as part of the efforts with the SDG Data Alliance to put that template together and uh, that it will be a resource we will be able to share with others as well. Um, so Alex, um, he is here from the Rwanda Land Authority. Um, we're happy to have you join us here today and you're very keen to partner. That's great. So we will definitely be uh, reaching out to you then and making sure that we can uh, discuss uh, development of the integrated data hubs with you. Um, Deepti, any comments that you would like to make? I don't want to put you on the spot, <laughs> but if you wanted to add anything about the, um, the, the templates and so forth and all, please feel free to do so. Yeah. And I'll 
Thanks, Karma. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, we are building solution templates uh, that will allow you to uh, create SDG Data Hub. Uh, we'll provide a starting point for countries to get started. Uh, we are going to put it in GitHub repository, uh, the, the codes and things so that it's available to anyone. You can expand on those, uh, which will allow countries to uh, bring their data in, join the data to boundaries and geographies and uh, create visualizations and, and, and those with it. So, uh, we are really excited about it. We're looking to do this soon and get it out for everyone and get feedback from countries to uh, use it. Great, thank you, Deepdi. Yeah, so those um, GitHub links and resources will um, be available. I just also wanted to share the um, um, before we finish, because it is on my last slide there, but um, I wanted to share the Alliance website so that you can submit your interest also there. Um, it is alliance.sdg.org, and uh, there's an opportunity to put in there some of your interest from your particular, um, you know, organization and how you'd like to engage as well, um, so that we can get those types of resources out to you. We'll be building a virtual center of excellence there um, where we share resources and so forth as we work with the member states and share the common best practices and things like that um, through the website as well. So you'll have that. Um, and Marlene, you've lost audio. I don't know, maybe can somebody watch if she tries to rejoin, perhaps try to rejoin. Um, we do have another 20 minutes or so, so I don't want you to miss the last comments. So um, feel free to try to rejoin. Um, can everybody else hear okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so what is the official website? Okay, I just shared it. Uh, Maria, it is alliance.sdg.org. Um, so we'll be eventually sharing those resources and templates and all um, through that, that site and through the workshops and engagements that we, we do with the other countries. Um, I just want to pause for a minute. Does anybody want to come in with a question or intervention besides through the chat? I want to make sure that we also have a lively conversation, get to see your faces. <laughs> so anybody else? Okay. Um, so um, there's a question from Fernando Martin, um, and he's asking, has the SDG Data Alliance thought about how to share all data and information among those with limited access to technology? I'm thinking on how to reach all people in Mozambique. Dashboards and others are beautiful, but um, are not leaving people behind. Um, how was it in Hawaii? Maybe Kaimana, you can address anybody that you've been working with to help um, make sure that we do reduce inequalities, including access to technology and information. Um, and maybe in some of the island nations, if there's any strategies you would like to share. Yeah, so we um, really focused on our community engagement. Um, we work with different uh, groups representing, especially around equity. So we have um, a broadband equity group that we consult with on a weekly basis. We have an energy equity group. Um, we have technical experts um, in academia and we do um, a lot of community engagement and outreach with our partners and our network. So we, um, we definitely don't wanna leave people behind. We acknowledge that broadband is an issue and we're trying to address that through tracking it on the dashboard so we can um, mobilize our policy and legislation working group to kind of um bring those issues to legislation and so um our we haven't quite struggled with um with that as much but that's definitely something especially as covid um really sh sh displayed the gaps in broadband um and how we want to communicate so we use our analytics to see um who is checking in on the dashboard um we're looking at disaggregating that by um whether indigenous people are actually looking at the dashboard finding it resourceful and through that analysis um, we're working with our partners to further our community engagement um but definitely in some of our um some of our areas in um, Big Island, like Pune, for example, is um, their broadband access is very limited. Hana um, in Maui, where I live, is also limited. So there are efforts um, to close that gap and to to reach people who currently don't have access to technology, such as Wi-Fi, and um, who can't access our dashboard currently. Um, and that's in the works. Um, that's going to take a lot of um, infrastructure, but we're working with those technical experts in that area that are part of our network to address those issues. 
Mm-hmm. Very much. Yeah, thank you, Kaimana. Um, I, I think sometimes looking at the dashboard and the analytics of who's watching it can actually help you understand where the gaps are, who's not watching it, or who's not engaging with your um, information products. Uh, Stephen, yeah, I was going to go to you next for sure. So thanks, please. Yeah, um, I think one of the things we're trying to do with um, the Data Alliance and specifically SDG.org, the digital platform, is use the information that all comes into it to actually tell better data stories because it's true not everyone's going to be able to log onto a dashboard and you know know how it all works and understand exactly what it means um but i think there is a key objective for us is thinking about how we tell some of these stories whether it's through video or whether it's connecting with other media sources locally um, nationally and globally to kind of take the information better, you know, better understand it and then better communicate it to to their constituents on the ground. So I just wanted to note that too, because I think it's a great point. Not everybody, you know, has the training or skills to kind of log in and and um, and access and understand information. I think part of a secondary objective of the Alliance and the whole project is how do we make it easier for people to, to tell stories and share uh, the information that they gather and learn from all the data. Yeah, I think that's so true. Uh, all the aspects and the different pathways of the IGAF, when you think about like the capacity building, I love that Tim mentioned even like the K through 12 or the, you know, primary school education opportunities that exist. We really need to be, I mean, we're, that would also be helping the SDG around education. If you think about how, if we really implement this and, and get kids th- thinking geospatially and we start working at that local level, uh, we really want to inspire our, our, you know, national uh, mapping agency authorities to think about how the information that they're collecting can really make a big impact on SDGs, uh, being able to model things like health accessibility or um, accessibility to schools, especially seasonal accessibility as some roads change during rainy seasons in parts of the world. All of these types of issues will help reduce inequalities and also really start creating a whole generation of sustainable thinkers because they will be geospatial and they'll be thinking about how you integrate information together. So um, it's really important to think about, um, you know, how do we get this information used in the everyday lives of people? Sustainability isn't about uh, just policy policy or technology or information. It's about behavior. And if we can really inspire people to use this information to change behaviors, I think that is uh, really critical. So that's very good. Anybody want to come on with any other comments? We have a lot of amazing talent that is participating in this side event. I see a number of folks that um, I won't call you out, but uh, if you have any comments or thoughts, we do welcome them. We only have about uh, 15 minutes left together. So. Um, any other thoughts, questions, um, questions on how to reach out to us or anything like that? We welcome um, as well. Anything? Okay. Any last comments from our presenters or thoughts that you'd like to share? Okay, I don't want to put you all on the spot. You've done your you've done your work already, so very good. I did want to also just point out that Stephen shared the STG Media Zone, um, the the link to the announcement and so forth, and uh, that STG Media Zone link um, has a full presentation. Uh, you'll get to hear from um, Alex, also from the uh, Kellogg Foundation, participated and so forth. So um, we've had a great relationship also with the Kellogg Foundation. They're uh, financially and actively supporting this this um, um, SDG Data Alliance, and um, we're really excited to continue the work that they have around really making communities um, uh, and enjoyable and functioning places for children. That's one of their um, efforts is really to reduce inequalities in order to improve communities so that children can reach their full potential. Um, so that is their interest in this particular alliance. So it's definitely very active and. Um, engaging alliance that we really want to make things happen and implement things on the ground at the local levels. Um, any last comments? Feel free to raise your hand. And I'm very sorry to our two colleagues, Monica and Adarito, um, who have not been able to join. There must be some technical challenge. So, Stephen, please. Stephen, you have your hand raised, please. 
Oh, sorry. I think that was from before. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. I just looked at the list. Apologies. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to thank you all uh, for the presentations and for the participation. We're very excited to launch this. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of or all of us as you like. Um, we're really excited to work together with um, nations large and small through the SDG Data Alliance. And um, well, let's see, it's a new question from Mohammed. Um, how does the SDG Data Alliance? Um, oops, I think I just lost the question. Um, help to develop statistics in GIS in developing countries? Um, that is maybe a question Linda might want to uh, address, but uh, we certainly are going to be working on helping establish um, the uh, means and mechanisms for the monitoring of the SDGs through official statistics from the national statistical agencies. Um, uh, yeah, Carmel, Linda. that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, Tim mentioned the statistics modernization program that is available to help you with the creation of that authoritative data and then the data alliance uh, tools and templates will help you be able to share that information in a meaningful way um, aligned to the goals to help you better understand and report on the goals. So I'm um, happy to get a, a conversation with you offline to answer more questions if that's helpful. That is great and wonderful. So, um, so we have a lot of engagement around you know, integration of geospatial and statistical information, and we look forward to keeping that going forward. And I think the SDGs gives us a really nice framework to be able to work towards um, for that purpose. Okay, well, thank you all very much for participating. Um, we're really excited to um, continue these discussions. I hope today is really just day one of those participations. Uh, we appreciate you spending all your time with us today, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future on uh, implementing geospatial technology towards reducing inequalities. Um, Oops, and uh, we hope that you'll share your interest and ideas with us uh, through that forum on the SDG Data Alliance website. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a really wonderful day and a fruitful 11th session of the GGIM next week. Thank you all.